I just want to preface this, but we added this part of the course uh, since many people said after the course, they felt like they wanted to be able to do more with Bash and like be, you know, power users and uh, do cool things. So we added this part and we understand that this is not for everyone. So if you feel that, okay, this is a bit too much, don't worry. You don't have to know this stuff. You can sit and type the commands just like you've done all morning and we'll do the rest of the course. So this is just to show you what you can do. So you know that, ah, okay. And also to kind of demystify it, it's not that complicated, the things that we will be doing. It's just, you have to kind of get into it. And then after a while, it gets pretty simple. So a very much reoccurring problem in bioinformatics and almost all computer-based work is that you want to do the same thing on many different files. So it could be you have many different samples, you want to analyze them just the same way. So you could sit by the computer and type, I want to run my program for this sample file. When it's finished, you do it for sample two, and sample three, four, five, six, all the way for all the samples. So if it's only nine samples, yeah, you can do this. If it takes a couple of minutes, it doesn't do that much. If it takes a couple of hours, maybe you have to go home, then it will be finished just when you come home and you won't be able to run the next one until tomorrow morning. So you have big gaps in your runtime. So it's okay to do this kind of, you know, 10 files. For a thousand files, it's starting to become unfeasible. I mean, you're not gonna sit there and type this a thousand times. And if you, want, if you want to do it again for re reproducibility, if you've done it once, you're probably not going to want to do it twice. And you can also not share it with anyone else. Since you did it like live in your terminal, you can't really share that experience to someone else. So they also have to sit there and type everything a thousand times. So the solution, of course, is that you write this as a script to save you from all this boredom. So... To start writing a script, we just use nano when we start editing a file. Let's call it analysis.sh. It doesn't exist yet, but when we type nano on the name of it, it will create it for us. So it's just going to be an empty file to start with. So the most basic form of a script is that you, yeah, you start typing the commands in here instead. It's still going to be a thousand times you have to type it. But if you have, have to do it again, you can just run this script and it will do it again. So you don't have to do this many times. You only have to suffer once. And you can share this file with your friends. So they don't have to sit there and type either. So you can just take this file, email it to someone. And then when you actually want to run this file, so we have our analysis.sh up here. We have all the sample files here. To run it, you just type bash, then the name of the script file. So bash analysis.sh. And it will just start running this file line by line. It will start with the first one. When that one is finished, it will take the second one, and then the third and fourth until the file is finished. So you still probably don't want to type this a thousand times even once. So there must be a way around this as well, right? So our file, yeah, and sometimes it's not only samples. Maybe you have a reference genome or some options to this program. So it's even more typing and a lot more repetitive things on each line here. So you see this reference thing, always the same. Whereas this column is always unique. It's always a new file name, but you have the rest here, which is yeah, same for everyone. So we have to solve this in two different ways. So we can start looking at, okay, so how do we solve this part. It's just repetitive data. How can we get rid of that? Then we have to start learning about the variables. So variables are built into Bash. It's pretty much like a small box you can put things in. So to use them, you just create them like this. So when you assign it, just type the name of the variable. You can name it whatever you want, equals, and then whatever you want to put in it. Could be a number, could be a text. You do, yeah, no spaces around here because then Bash will think it's two separate commands. So everything in one single word like this. And if you have spaces in the text you want to input into a variable, you have to quote it. Otherwise, you think this space will be a separator. Oh. And then when you want to use the variable, 
you have to have a dollar sign in front of the name to signify to bash that this is a variable. You shouldn't interpret this as the text my variable. This is a spe special thing. So an example can look like this, and this dollar sign is not to do with, with variables. This is just to show you this is on the command line. So then you just type my variable equals Martin, and then you can run a program and use this variable. So the echo program will just echo back whatever you tell it. So in this case, it will see the text, hello, and then, oh, here's a variable. So what bash will do is that it will go through, before it executes this command, it will go through this command line and see, okay, so we have a variable here. Then it's gonna do something called, yeah, it will evaluate the variable. So it will look at the content of the variable and put that text here instead. So the output of this will be, hello, Martin. So it doesn't actually print dollar my variable. It takes the content on that variable and uses that instead. So the way we can use this is that instead of having to type this times and times over, we can do like this. We create a variable up here called ref. Ref should equal this text, references slash human genome.fa. And then on every single line when we want to use this, we just type dollar ref. So now, if we want to switch which genome we want, we do that in one single place. We don't have to update every single line where we type this. We just change this definition of the variable up here, and that's going to be the text that is being used on all of these lines. So now we don't have to type as much, and if we have to change something, we only have to do it in one single location. But we still have this part over here, which is still unique for every line, so we can't solve that with one variable that we put here at the top. So then we have to start doing something called loops. So there are two different loops in Bash and in most programming languages. They're called for and while. They work slightly different, but the thing is you want to repeat doing something many times. So now we're going to look at the for loop. So this is how you define a for loop in Bash. And that you can pretty much learn by heart. You always type for, and then you have to name a variable, which is the loop variable that is going to be used in this loop. You can name it whatever you want. Many people name it i if it's an integer. But yeah, most of the times, try to name it something that actually makes sense in the code that you're going to run. So here it's named var. It's pretty non-descriptive. So it's actually a bad variable name, I would say. And don't be afraid to use long variable names. If it makes it easier to read the code below, it's just a good thing to have long variable names. So, and then you type in, and then you have to give bash some kind of list or some kind of yeah collection of elements that it will loop over. So in this case, it's just the numbers one, two, and three. And then after the list, you have a semicolon, and then you type do, and then you start typing all the bash code you want. So it could be CD to different places, you could run programs, you can copy files back and forth, and everywhere you use $var, it will take whatever var is containing at the moment. So what this code, code will do is that in the first iteration of the loop, when it comes here in the code and it says, ah, a for loop. So it's going to look at, OK, so here's the loop variable. I'm going to take the first element of this list. I'm going to put that inside var. And then I'm going to run this code, which is between do and done. In this case, it's only one line. You can have thousands of lines between these two. There's no limit. So it's going to execute all the commands here. So right now, it's only echo dollar $var. So in the first iteration, $var will contain the number 1. And then it reaches this done. Then it will start over. But now it will take the second element, put it into $var, and then run that code. So the second time, $var will contain number 2 instead. And then in the third iteration, it will take number 3, put that one into $var, and run this code. So the output of running this program down here is that the computer will print out one, two, three. So here you can have as many as you want. You can have up to, you know, you can write all the numbers up to 1,000. It would still work. You can write it up to a million, probably would still work. You can also have text. doesn't have to be numbers. So as you see here, the spaces are what separates these elements from each other. Here's the first element. Here's the second one. Here's the third one. 
Or you can mix them. You don't have to be strict to any specific type. It can be numbers and it can be text. You can also use these patterns that we looked at before. So here, for instance, star.txt, that's like a shortcut for doing a ls star.txt. Since it's so common that you want to operate on files when doing for loops, they built this in. So you don't have, actually have to type ls. So if you just type a file pattern like this, it will do a ls star.txt, and it will return the list of all the file names. So in this case, when we ran this, we were standing in a folder that contained three text files, one called all.txt, one examples.txt, and readme.txt. So it just ran this code three times, once for each file that it found. So what we can do now with our code here is that we can switch this out. So instead of having a long list of commands, we have this for loop. So for, and now we'll call the loop variable file, since it's going to be a file, so it kind of makes sense in the code down below. The computer doesn't care what you name it. In star.bam, so for all BAM files in the directory you're standing when you execute this script, it will do this, myprog dash r dollar ref, which still is whatever we assign it up here, and then dollar file. So now it doesn't matter anymore if I have one file, 10 files, a thousand files, or 10 billion files. I don't have to change anything here. I can add as many BAM files as I want. I don't have to change this code one bit because this star.bam is just going to fetch all of them and it's going to run this code for them. So this is the power of loops that you can define what you want to do once and then you can repeat it as many times as you like. So you don't have to type all these commands. And a good thing, before you actually run this code, you might want to make sure that it actually does what you think it's going to do. So instead of actually running the program, type echo in front of it, because then it's just going to print the command it would have run. So when you run this with the echo here, instead of running this command, it will just print it to the screen. So then you can see that, okay, so it runs my prog, this reference variable got resolved to the right value, and then you can see the sample name updates, and it's for all the files that you think it was going to be. And once you've seen that and you're happy with it, you can remove the echo and actually run this program. So now you can start this and you can leave work and it's going to continue running. You don't have to sit there and click next when it's time for the next sample. It's just going to continue running until it's finished. So now we're going to look at something called arguments because as it is here in this script, Everything in here is kind of like predetermined. The only thing that is dynamic here is this star.bam. It kind of depends on which folder you're standing in when you run this, because another folder will contain different BAM files. But if you want to change, for instance, the reference genome, you can't do that. The only way to change that is by editing this file and actually changing this text here. That's a bit unflexible. So one way to get around that is to use something called uh, arguments. And it's a way to get data into programs when you execute them. So we all run programs this morning that when we typed like ls and then a file pattern or bash the name of a file. And then we could give it some extra options here at the end. So these are the arguments that is going to be accessible for the script. So all the words that we give it here, you see the spaces in between? The spaces are the separators between all the arguments. So inside the script, whatever we typed as the first word after the name of the script is going to be stored in a variable called $1. And Bash takes care of putting that inside $1. We don't have to think about it. We just know that all the arguments we give a program are going to be stored in these dollar number variables. So one way we can do this is maybe we don't want to always be standing in the folder where we want to run this. So this star.bam is kind of un inflexible. We want to say, like with ls, I want to ls that folder over there. It would be nice if we can tell our script, I want to run this analysis for all the files in that folder over there. So what we can do then is we add here $1 slash. So when running this script, it will take whatever you gave it as the first word, it's going to be inputted here before it executes the code. 
So for instance, if we run the program like this, bash analysis.sh and then path to my data. It's going to take this, store it in $1. And before it runs this code in that for loop, it's going to replace $1 with whatever it contains, which happens to be this. So then it's going to say, for a file in path to my data, star.bam. So now all of a sudden we can control which folder it looks for BAM files in. Yeah, so this is what the computer is going to see before it executes this for loop. So then we have something called control statements. So this is going to be an if statement. So this is a way to control which code gets executed. And you can say that, okay, so I only want to do this if this condition is true or not. It's kind of like if, if someone is going to the grocery store, I can say, if the bread is on discount, buy one loaf. So then you know that they're only going to buy a loaf if there's a discount on the bread. If it's not, they're not going to buy it. But it's like this conditional shopping. Now we're going to do that with bash code instead. So the, the structure is kind of similar to the uh, for loop. So we have if now instead, then you have some kind of condition. It's like a test. And this has to be able to evaluate to either true or false. Those are the only two that it can be. And then semicolon, then you have a then. Then you have all the bash code you want to perform. It could be thousands of lines or one line. It's up to you. And then to say that, okay, now I'm going to close this if statement. Then you type fi, so if backwards. So all code between the if and phi is going to be executed if the condition is true. So one way to have true is that you just type true. So this is like the answer. Uh, so it's not a test. It's like it's always going to be true. So this code is always going to be run. It's going to type out this is true. If you change this to false, then the result is nothing is going to happen. It's not going to run this code. It's just going to come here and see oh, it's false, then I'm going to jump here instead and continue. Then you can start adding these tests. So in this case, you can compare. So if the text hello is identical to the text hello, then I wanted to print out this, and it does. This is not the same for the computer. So hello is not identical to hi. You can use these wildcards in the comparisons as well. So hello is identical to hell followed by whatever. And you can also compare numbers. So if five is identical to nine, which is not. Or you can say if five is less than nine. So this is going to be true. Or you can ask if it's greater than nine. And that's going to be false, of course. So then... Bash also have this math context, so then it's going to interpret everything as numbers. So then you can use this instead of the dash LT and dash GT, you can get these uh, mathematical operators instead. And then you can add stuff together and do some simple mathematics inside this expression. So let's say that we want to do this analysis that we just wrote in the previous script. We want to do that, but only for the dog samples. We don't want to analyze anything else. So if we just run this, it's going to take all the BAM files. So let's say that we have a folder with mixed BAM files from different species. Then we're going to have a problem because it's going to analyze all of them. So what we can do then is that we add some kind of if statement. So the only, only thing that happened here is that we added this if statement here. So the loop is still defined exactly the same way. So here we want to check if file is identical to dog followed by whatever we want to run this. So let's see, how does this work? Because if file at the moment contains this whole path, so path to my data, dog samples here, one, bam, that is not identical to dog because here's supposed to start with dog followed by whatever. This one doesn't start with dog. It's only the file name that does. So maybe we do this. We add two stars to it. It could be whatever in the beginning. It has to have dog somewhere and then followed by whatever. So this could work to fish out dog samples. But then we could have the problem that we pick out this. 
the dog is now here. It's not actually the sample file we're looking at. Now it picked up dog from one of the folder names. So this is actually a lizard sample file. So that would give us the wrong analysis. We don't actually want to do this. We have to modify. We have to do something smarter. So there's a built-in program in Bash called base name. And the only thing that base name does is that it removes the path in front of file names. So it makes sure that you only get the actual file name. So many programs in Linux are built this way. They are super small. They do very specific things. So you can like build them together in a pipeline. So you don't have one pro program trying to solve all your problems because you can't really foresee everything. So instead, they made everything very modular. So you have a base name, which it only picks away paths from file names. It's a very specific thing to do, but it's quite useful to be able to use it. If you were to run this on a command line like this, just base name, path to blah, 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 blah. It will just return the actual file name. So how do we use this in an if statement then? Then we can do something called a subshell substitution. So if you do a dollar sign followed by a parenthesis, it means open up a tiny terminal window here, and run only this command, and then you take whatever that command typed back and put it here instead, kind of like a variable when it replaces the variable name with the variable content, the subshell substitution will run a program and substitute this whole dollar parenthesis thing with whatever that program returned. So this whole thing here will get replaced by whatever it returned, would happen to be dog underscore sample, zero one dot bam. So then all of a sudden our pattern up here works. Now we only look at the actual file name. We're not gonna be tricked by having dog somewhere in the path name. So this is something that we could use. So if we transfer that, yeah. So when it runs, it can evaluate, it's gonna re be replaced here and that's gonna be true. So then we can input that here. So if, then we have this double order brackets to say that this is a test of some kind. So, then we have the subshell substitution, which is run this command and replace this whole thing with whatever it returned. So base name for dollar file. So dollar file is gonna be first substituted with whatever dollar file contains at the moment. So the first file name containing path and everything. Then we're gonna run base name on that. I'm gonna substitute this with whatever that returned. And then we're gonna check that towards, is that identical to dog followed by whatever? And if that is true, it's gonna run this code here. And then it's gonna jump out and do the next iteration. It's gonna take the second file. It's gonna do the test. If it doesn't match, then it's just gonna skip and then it start over. And then it's just gonna loop around and around and around until you've done all the files in your folder. Yeah, and then when you're happy, you see that the, the echo when it printed out whatever you thought it was going to print out, you see that it's only dog samples there, then you remove the echo and then you run the program for real. So there are many different languages when it comes to programming. Maybe you heard Java and C++ and these kind of things, JavaScript. So the more common ones in uh, bioinformatics are, well, used to be Perl, but like 10 years ago, it stopped, stopped being that popular. So Python and Bash and R and these kind of things. And many people are like, oh, which one should I pick? What if I pick the wrong one, then I'm lost. They're not that different. So I would say it's more like dialects. So here's the Bash code of the program we just ran. So we had the for loop, put it in this file variable, we do base name, we check it, we run the program. If we do this in Perl instead, we have some extra formalities up here. We have to import some packages, but then we have a for loop but they call it for each. You have to have my dollar file instead of just file. And this LS thingy is a bit more complicated in Perl, but yeah, whatever we gave it as an argument, star.bam, if base name for file. You see, it's not a completely different language. It's just different dialects. And if you look at Python, how that will look instead. Yeah, also you have to import some stuff in the beginning to get access to all the tools. Then you have a for loop. Then you have this if statement and base name, and then you run the program down here. So it doesn't really matter which one you pick. As long as you pick one and start doing it, 
because then you will learn how to program because they all work the same way. It's always the same logic. So it's quite easy to switch language. It doesn't really matter which one you pick. So pick one, get good, and then just keep going. You can always switch. So for this lab, we will be doing some programming. You could do everything in Nano, but Nano is not very nice. It's kind of ugly. It's kind of hard to navigate. So I would recommend that you use a program called Gedit, which is a graphical text editor, very similar to like Notepad or Notepad++ if you start on Windows or some other tool in Mac OS. So I would recommend you use ThinLink for this lab and you open up Gedit in there. Just type Gedit in a terminal. You might even find it through the application menu in the desktop environment. It will open up something like this. And as you can see, it's way more festive than Nano could ever be. You have syntax highlighting on by default. And you can see different types of text get different colors. So like variables and equal signs and stuff like that, they're just black. And if you have a string, like text with quotes around it, they're purple. Function names like the length function, those get colored in this nice way. So it's just easy to see it. Ah, okay, so here are lots of control statements. Here are strings. It's just much easier to read the code. There are some modifications that we do to the settings of get it also before getting started, like to get to get it extra nice. So one of them is activating. It's going to go back and forth between these slides just to point out some things. The most important, I would say, is this one over here. Print out the line number. Because every time you get an error message when writing scripts, it usually prints out, you have an error on line 10. Then you can just go to line 10 and see, ah, oh, okay, that's error. Second one here is like a minimap of the code. It's kind of like a super zoomed out view because if you have code that is like several pages long, you kind of know how it looks from afar since you've scrolled through it so many times. So then you can just jump to the, the right section in the script pretty quickly here. Another one is highlight the line that you were on. So you see this gray marking here. So you see where your cursor is. And another lifesaver is this one that you see over here. Do you see the brackets? It matches highlighting on matching brackets. So if you hover your cursor on this bracket, it will automatically highlight the matching bracket on the other side. Because if you have many functions calling inside other function inside other functions, Sometimes it's easy to lose track on how many, many closing parentheses you should have. And you can also change which colors you want. So the only difference between these two is the color scheme or the theme. So this is the original theme in Get It or default theme. This one is called Kate, has a bit, yeah, just a bit darker colors. I would recommend this one. It's called Oblivion. Right? Maybe that one is, yeah. Oblivion, I think, is included in uh, Get It by default. This one is my favorite. It's called uh, Monokai. It's not installed by default, but yeah. you can uh, install it. I think I have instructions on how to install it in the lab. A dark background is very nice if you stare at this screen for a long time. If it's just white, it's going to burn your eyes. If you have the dark one, it's just nicer. And nice contrast and nice colors. So these are the ones I would recommend that you do. So you can look at the lecture notes later on when you start get it. So like display line numbers, display the overview map, highlight current line, highlight matching brackets. And yeah, you can set the tab width and use spaces instead of tabs. These are also like things that just makes your code look nice and tidy. And then you can change the color and font. It's so like Kate if you like light backgrounds or Oblivion if you like the dark backgrounds.